So we're here with Jane Kirkham, Labour candidate for the European elections uh, for the South West. That's right. So Jane, what are your policies as an MEP and what would you like to achieve for the South West if elected? Um, there's an awful lot I would like to achieve for the South West. The, the thing about the European Parliament, if you just take as the fact that if we are elected, say we did serve five years in the European Parliament, um, there is so much you can do in the European Parliament, probably in lots of ways, more than you can do in Westminster, because um, MEPs co-legislate in a way that uh, Westminster MPs don't get the chance to. Obviously, in our adversarial system, legislation is proposed by the government and then pretty much voted through on their majority. It's not like that in the European Parliament. It's done very much on um, more consensus politics and discussion and committee. So there are all sorts of areas we could make a really big impact and the Labour Party with our, um, with our sister parties have done that already in lots of areas. I mean, I used to be an employment lawyer, workers' rights, really, really important to me. And that's an area where the European Union have made huge strides because of course we lost a lot of our employment laws. Um, in the uh, Thatcher era really, a lot of our collective rights and the U European Union has built up individual rights which we, um, we signed on to when we signed the social chapter when Blair came into power and since then the EU has done all sorts of things in workers rights that I would like to um, do more of, particularly at the moment um, the socialist parties are looking at things like bogus self-employment um, and um, zero hours contracts, that kind of thing, so that's an area having some knowledge and some background in employment law that I'd certainly like to do more in. Um, looking again, as a Cornish MEP, as being the, the first Labour Cornish MEP, I would really like to um, restructure the way that the structural funding is dealt with in this country. Because of course, at the moment, that's all dealt with very centrally. Um, I would like that devolved down. Labour certainly would like more of that, more of the allocation of that structural funding devolved down to Cornwall, where we could do it more locally and we could actually decide ourselves where it should go within Cornwall because we have benefited hugely obviously we've had over a billion euros since um, when well, the last 20 years um, but there is we could target it a lot better and I think if we were to be able to do that more locally then it could have a massive massive impact and we've worked out that we would requalify for the next tranche from 21 to 28 and we could be we could be up for 350 million euros more um, just for Cornwall because of course structural funding is allocated on need not politics and the worry is if we left the EU anything that comes out of the UK shared prosperity fund that the Conservatives are proposing is much more up for grabs it doesn't look like any of it would be ring fenced for Cornwall in the same way that structural funding has been unless there was a Labour government of course who have talked about ring fencing money for Cornwall specifically so I would very much like to have a hand in how that structural funding is, is looked at and distributed. Well the Labour Party especially under your current leadership have often been touted as a party of the young so what do you feel you would bring for young people in the South West as a Labour MEP? Um, there is a lot that the EU um, has done, again I was talking about employment, employment rights and for um, young people in the South West, particularly when it comes to em employment and of course um, education. Looking again at Cornwall because that's where I'm from, this university where we are, a lot of that came with EU funding. The EU has helped a lot for just indirectly things like transport down here. It's easier to get around Cornwall, we had money for um, signal workings for the St Earth modal um, transport modal hub, for um, the airport, for the air ambulance, for the roads, just to make Cornwall easier to get around and get to. I would like to look at um, funding, well a Labour government would do this anyway, they have said they would, but through Europe as well for, for better trade rail links to Cornwall and Plymouth. This is something Luke Pollard, our nearest MP, has been talking about for, for years and years and years. Um, since the Dawlish, um, since the problems with the Dawlish line, nothing's, it hasn't been properly dealt with, the money hasn't been invested as it should have, that's something that I think would be really important to get more younger people down to Cornwall and working in Cornwall and make Cornwall thrive. Um, all the stuff that Europe has done for environmental protections and green energy, um, green energy and, and renewables, that technology is here, we need to get the people down here to, to really build it up and make it thrive. That's something that Europe could obviously help with and has been. Um, so yeah, the, lots of things. <laughs> I'll stop now. Well, we've just had a set of local elections. Yeah. Um, in which Labour 
did quite markedly worse than expected. What do you think caused your party to lose support at a time when opposition parties traditionally do well? Yeah, I, of course, that is, it has been reported that way. Of course, the Tories lost over 1,300 seats. We lost about 80. So comparatively... Yes, but Labour was expected to gain. But yes, the losing. idea was we were to gain and we did lose. I mean, strangely, we did better in the southwest, particularly the far southwest, than we did in other places. In Plymouth, we actually gained a seat on the City Council and um, retained control of Exeter, of course. So down here, and of course, we didn't have local elections in Cornwall. But people do feel left behind and people I expect are frustrated by the fact that um, we've had three years of expecting the government to do something about Brexit and Europe and nothing happening. And of course, people have been left behind in that time. That's the other thing. All the things that should have been dealt with, like the NHS and getting rid of austerity and all the other things that a government should have been doing that they haven't been doing. They've been sitting on their hands and thinking about this one main policy that they haven't delivered so people are frustrated and angry with politics in general i think particularly the government obviously with their 1300 seats but the opposition as well well why why do you think there is that frustration with the opposition you, you've made quite a strong case for people to vote against the government but not really explain why labor specifically lost seats on the doorstep, we, we very much had it was a frustration with the political process, with the political establishment. And of course, Her Majesty's government and Her Majesty's opposition are together that establishment. And I think people reacted against that. They just wanted something more. And obviously the frustration that Parliament together hadn't managed to come together and either deliver Brexit or, or, or stop Brexit, depending on what your opinion is, caused a lot of frustration with people generally. So I think it's the, the process and the, and the two parties at the top who are running it. Do you find it worrying at all that the party was unable to make significant gains against government that performed at its worst rate since 1995? Um, as I said, down here we did make some gains, but um, yes, of course it is frustrating and it's frustrating because <laughs> Labour has a lot to offer and a lot to say as well because of the if you think about the June 2017 manifesto and how people reacted to that so well that it's frustrating that we're now at this point where Brexit has kind of overtaken everything and people are, are not seeing if we were to have a Labour government, all the things that that government could offer and all the things, all the policies that were in our manifesto that were so, so popular at the time. Um, so, yes, that it, it's frustrating that we can't move beyond that, that Brexit is clogging everything up. Well, are you worried that that performance could have a, a knock-on effect and have a result of a poor performance in the European elections? Um, it's a bit of an unknown quantity, isn't it, the Euros? We don't really know how people are going to vote because we have these extra parties that we didn't have at the local elections. I do hope that people think when they vote about who they're sending to the European Parliament particularly because um, we may only be there till October, but we may be there a lot longer. And the European Parliament, as I said, it co-legislates. It's important that you have people who go there and put the work in and, and turn up. Um, I mean, Farage went to, well, we're talking about Cornwall and, and, say, fishing, which is important to Cornwall. He was on the Fisheries Committee. I understand he went to one out of 43 meetings. Now, if you're going to vote for people to go, they've got to turn up and do the job. So I want, I want people to, to remember when they vote that they're not just um, registering um, their view on Brexit, but they're voting for people to go and do a job and they need to think, you know, obviously the people who go and do that job need to really want to do it and get stuck into it. Recent predictions from the BBC suggested that if there was a general election tomorrow, there would be no majority party. If this was the case, who would you prefer Labour to enter a coalition with? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, oh, I want a majority Labour government. I think we've got such a transformative agenda and there's so much that we want to do that um, in the current system that we've got, um, it would be so good to be able to get on and do it with a, ma with a majority government. Um, uh, it, 
it would completely depend, wouldn't it, on the vote and, and how it went. If it went the way of the local elections, then the Lib Dems have made this massive resurgence, obviously, whether it's people have forgotten that they went to coalition with the Tories in 2010, or whether it is some sort of reaction to Brexit or just not having anybody else to vote for. We may, they may have the, they may have more um, MPs as they did in um, 2010 again. So who knows really, but I want a majority Labour government. <laughs> there have been a number of quite highly publicised defections, resignations from the party, the most recent being Sir Tony Robinson. Do you have anything to say to the people who have left the party and have you yourself ever considered doing so? <sighs> I've been in the Labour Party a very long time, since I was a student in the mid-90s, so 25 years. I stuck in it all the way through. Um, I joined after I saw John Smith come and speak at my university in Southampton. Um, I thought he was fabulous. Um, and I've got those Labour values that I think have always been at the root of what Labour have done, whoever has been there. So no, I've, I've not really thought about leaving. I think it is a great shame um, that various people, talking about the independent group, for example, that, that they felt they had to leave. Um, I think we're stronger together, we're better as a broad church. Um, I think the more people we bring into the Labour Party, then the stronger it is and the more people it can represent. Brexit, let's move on to Brexit. <laughs> Brexit is undoubtedly the most politically dominant issue for a generation, as, as you yourself have already said. Yeah. And it seems like everyone's picked a side. So I think a lot of people are interested and a lot of voters are interested. Is Labour a party for leaving the European Union or remaining in it? Well, you've seen the policy. <laughs> the po many the, have, <laughs> the po many yeah, the policy is um, if we can't get a good deal, a strong deal, a deal that um, satisfies Labour six tests, and we can't get a general election, then the public vote option is the one that would be the only remaining one on the table. That's Personally, not what the policy says though, is it? The policy says they would consider all options, on including a public, a public vote. vote. It does not say but that, that the, would be the public yeah, vote is the last option. That that would be. If we don't get the other two options, that's logically where we would end up. And the way things are looking at the moment, we're not going to, it doesn't look like we're going to agree a deal. Um, it, that does not look amazingly promising, not a good deal, what would be considered to be a good deal anyway. Um, and there may be a general election, who knows? But the way I see it is we're going to end up at the same place and we're going to be considering the public vote. Now, I was one of those who would have liked to vote on any deal. Um, so if we were to end up in that place, then that, that would be a sensible place for us to be, as I can see it, because I don't think that we should leave the EU now without people having a say on that deal once it's clear what it actually will entail, which of course it wasn't at the start at all back in 2016. Well, there's been a, a lot of pressure on the party to support a public vote. Uh, why do you think the party has been so resistant to doing so outright? Um, because I think the party um, feels it's important to respect democracy and to respect the result of the first um, of the first referendum, um, and and of course um, there are a lot of people who are very angry, and there are a lot of people in um, seats with Labour MPs who have made their feelings known to their MPs, and their MPs are there to represent them. Are you so, saying then that? having a public vote and supporting it outright would not be respecting the results No, of the because as I said before, I think things have changed so much and any deal we get is going to be so different to what was put to the people. We had this, it, it was Cameron's get out of jail card to get to, to placate UKIP and the right of his party, wasn't it? It was so binary. It was so, well, we don't expect this to go anywhere. It was in or out. The referendum was um, people were well people were lied to weren't they really so nobody really knew what the outcome would be three years nearly down the road we have much more of an idea and I don't think I don't think that's an affront to democracy to say right you voted in or out but ultimately this is the deal we're going to get now is this what you envisaged is this what you really want now make your choice I don't think I, it's more democracy not less really well, from my point of you view. You mentioned David Cameron. Yeah. Um, and he 
before the 2016 referendum, stood up in Parliament and said words to the effect of, this is the only referendum, this is a once in a generation choice, this is the last one. Do you think he may have inadvertently or even deliberately misled the House on that occasion? I don't know. That referendum was only advisory legally anyway, wasn't it? So um, whether he was misleading them or not, it, it was hasty, it was foolish, it was arrogant of him to even do it just to try and heal the divisions in his own party. I mean, I'm not going to defend David Cameron one way or the other. I think he should stay in his shepherd's hut for the foreseeable future and not come out. Do you think there's anything to be said for the reports that the split in the party, the, the Labour Party, over the people's vote is due to the, the membership wishing to remain, as polls would suggest, and the leadership, particularly Jeremy Corbyn, wishing to leave? Because it's not really been touched on, but Jeremy has been a Eurosceptic for pretty much all of his parliamentary career. Um, I think Jeremy Corbyn is a great believer in democracy, party democracy, democracy in the country. Um, and I think that is very um, important to, to him. I, it's trying to square a circle, isn't it? The country split, the Labour Party split, the Tory Party split, everyone split. So it, it's trying to keep everybody together. Um, I think certainly I went to the um, conference where our policy was decided and it was clear, it was very, very strongly supported. I was in the hall, I would say at least, you know, 80% of the hall were very, very strongly in favour of that policy and keeping the option of a public vote there on the table with an option to remain as well. Um, so I think what he's trying to do is respect the democratic will of the members of his party, the democracy in the country, and trying as much as possible to keep the party together as Theresa May is doing, but you know, trying to, trying to put the country first as well, because the country's split, the country's more split than the parties. And to be honest, while we take our eye off the ball of what's happening in the country, that's the important thing, isn't it? Is trying to bring everyone back together and then carry on and hopefully then get a general election, get rid of austerity, look after the NHS and make the country a, a place a place that means people don't feel like they're left behind in the way they did in 2016. Well, I, I would just like to talk to you briefly about the, the idea of the public vote, which you right. didn't support. Um, the debate at the moment and the deadlock in Parliament is really one over which deal we have or how we leave. There was a referendum supporting leaving. There was then a general election in which the majority of the major parties would get, they were given the majority of the vote, both standing on manifesto saying that they would leave the EU. Surely That's been used so much but there, But surely if the, if the debate is over how we leave and not whether, why should a public vote have the option to remain on the ballot paper? Because that's the status quo. That's the default position. That's where we are and where we have been for 40 years. But the status quo has already been rejected in two separate votes. It, well, in a referendum, very narrowly, when people didn't, automat didn't really know what they were voting on and what the final deal would be or how long it would take to sort out or what a god-awful mess it would become, basically. And in the general election, I don't think people were voting just on Europe, were they? I mean, the two parties said they would try and respect the result of the referendum, but there were so many other things. I mean, I'm talking about our manifesto. I would hope people voted Labour for things like nationalising rail and the utilities, for, making, for giving more money to the NHS, for looking at education. There is so much more that people voted on then. I don't think that can be seen as a mandate for Brexit in any way, shape or form. And then I'm going back to my first argument, which is back in 2016, people were misinformed. People didn't know the complexities of what they were voting on. And after three years of this mess, they now do. Were people misinformed by the Labour manifesto in 2017 when it said that they would leave the European Union and are now uh, moving towards having a public vote? But then, of course, we're back to what, what our conference policy is, which is try and agree a deal, try and respect the referendum, try and agree a deal that is good for the people of Britain. Now, most people, I think, realise that um, membership of the EU is the best deal that we had and anything else will be a lesser deal than that. Um, but that's, 
it, that's what the policy says, that's where we're going and that's how we're trying to respect the, the result. Well, just on the, on the subject of that policy, uh, the initial option there is to seek a customs union. Yeah. For Labour voters who also voted to leave, and, and there are many of them, can that really be seen as, as properly leaving the EU or is it just leaving in name only? Um, it's leaving the EU without damaging jobs and prosperity and, 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 and without costing the country huge amounts. I mean, Parliament have already rejected no deal. No deal is something that nobody wants to see. It will make people poorer, a lot poorer. What, um, what the negotiation, our negotiating team are trying to do is find a Brexit that won't damage the economy, that won't damage people's jobs and their futures um, as much as possible. And that seems to be the best way of doing it. If you're not going to stay in the EU, that is the closest that we can get, causing as little damage as possible. Although, I, I mean, obviously you hear a lot of people talking about what the people voted for in 2016. But Did they vote for a getting out, no deal, I'm not uh, saying they did, uh, but most of, the, <laughs> most of the polling would indicate that the two major issues for Leave voters were bureaucratic control and regulatory control um, and immigration. Under a Labour customs union, we would, would we not, still be bound by the regulations of the EU and also still have to accept free movement? Not free movement because it's a customs union, not the single market. So the customs union means that free movement wouldn't be part of it, doesn't it? Um, but um, yes. Sorry, what was the f the f first bit of the question about? The I got regulatory control. So would, oh, would the decisions yeah. still be made? It, yeah, but if we're going to trade with Europe, we have to comply with the rules and regulations for the tr for trading with Europe anyway. We have to make sure that our goods are compliant with certain um, legislation anyway, and we wouldn't get a say over that if we left anyway. Is, this is way, at least, though, to a free trade agreement where the two sides meet, negotiate terms, and then if those terms change, they have to be renegotiated, as opposed to a customs union where we just enter the customs union and any rule that's made from then on we dynamically align with. We, we, but that protects tr the trade and also it protects the, um, of course, the, you took about the backstop in Northern Ireland as well. We need to stay in the customs union for that reason as well. There are so many r more reasons to stay in the customs union than, than just the financial ones. So we're looking at a way of, of coping with the, the argument about the backstop as well. And, and a customs union seems to be the only way to do that and maintain and maintain the lack of that border in Northern Ireland. So in a customs union and under a Labour government, would Parliament be given a vote each time the European Union changed its regulation to whether we wanted to or not align with that regulation? Um, I can't answer that question, to be honest. I, I think once you're, if it's a customs union, it may look different to the customs union. I'm not sure exactly what terms they would, uh, would agree that on. Well, the indication from the EU seems to be that the customs union is the only customs union on offer. Right, I assume that would be, that's, yeah, that would be an unknown, that would be something that would have to be negotiated once these negotiations are finished. Jane Kirkham, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.